Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath he taught the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Go away, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. All the people were amazed and said to each other, What words these are? With authority and power, he gives orders to impure spirits and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever and it left her. She got up once and began to wait on them. At sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness and laying his hands on each of them, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, you are the son of God but he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. At daybreak, Jesus went to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to see where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because this is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Good morning. It's been a minute since I've had the opportunity to preach, so I'm glad to to be up here with you doing something a little different this week. Um, Speaking of this week, I I stumbled onto something recently. Um, Maybe you're familiar with it. They're called ambigrams. Uh, Ambigrams, they're, they're several centuries old, but they came into popular view around the 1970s. And what they are is they're, they're words or, or designs that can be read when flipped upside down or, or rotated or viewed from a different perspective. And so sometimes it's the, the same word flipped upside down. I have an example here. Um, earth. Now, if you took this and you flipped it upside down, it would read Earth. And so sometimes it's the same word. Sometimes, though, it's a completely different word, like this next one. Uh, The top says sun, and the bottom says moon. And so it's just the same thing flipped upside down. Now, some of these, though, are completely different words. Um, So the first of those we have is on the top, angel. On the bottom, devil. And it's just flipped upside down. Um, The next here we got love and hate. And then finally, life or death. So what's really fascinating to me about these is you, you have this word that you understand to mean one thing. And then when you flip it upside down, it actually means something very different. And this is not unlike what Jesus did. You know, he took these commonly understood ideas, he flipped them upside down, giving them new meaning. He, he said things like, blessed are the poor. Or um, the greatest will be the servant of all. Or, or the last shall be first. Things that, that really don't make sense unless you, you, know, you hear what Jesus is saying and he unpacks them for you. He did things that no one else did too. He, he gave high esteem to women and children. No one else was doing that in his day. He welcomed sinners He reoriented our understanding of wealth and he gave a vision for a very different kingdom, which leads us to what we're talking about today. We're we're moving into um, kind of a, a new old series new old series. It's new because we're moving into something different. We um, are turning the page from the community service we were in the last couple of weeks, but it's old because we're actually coming back to a series that we started last year 
on the book of Luke. And we had always intended to come back to Luke. Some things happened, you may be aware. We, did, we had to pivot a little, adjust. Um, but we now find ourselves picking back up in the book of Luke and talking about the upside down kingdom. So for the next several weeks, we will be walking through Luke, picking up where we left off in Luke chapter four. And the video that you just saw was verses 31 through 44 of Luke chapter four. And I wonder in that video, as, as you listened, like what, what stood out to you about the passage? You know, was it, um, I think for many of us, it's, it's healing, it's the miracles that Jesus is doing, and that is certainly a huge part of, of the story that Luke is telling. Um, but I think there are also two other things that are very important to Luke that he's trying to point out to us as readers. Now, Luke, he wrote his gospel to the Greeks, one Greek in particular, um, but to Greeks as opposed to the Jews. And so when you're talking about Jesus and what he did to the Greeks, it's, it's a very different thing than saying it to the Jews. The Jews had this expectation that God was going to bring a Messiah, that he was going to come in power, and he was going to basically save them, fix everything. That was the expectation of the Jews. But the Greeks had no such expectation of who God is or what he was going to do. So Luke approaches his gospel a little bit differently than the other gospel writers because he has a different audience in mind. So with that in mind, two things that I think Luke is trying to point out about Jesus to these Greek readers of his writing. The first we see uh, in verse 31, it says, Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath he taught the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. Now, this is a subtle verse, uh, two verses that almost can feel like a throwaway when, when you're looking at like, oh, wow, he, he's casting out demons and he's doing all these incredible things. Um, but Luke is trying to point out something very important about Jesus. He's, he's teaching, and the people, they're amazed at this teaching. Why? Because his teaching came with authority. And so this is, I believe, the first thing that Luke wants us to see about Jesus, that Jesus came with authority. Let's talk about authority for a moment. That's a fun word nowadays. Um, sociologist Charles Taylor, so in his book, A Secular Age, he writes about um, this shift that's happened in the last five centuries in the West from a culture of authority to a culture of authenticity. And his point is that we no longer live by what authority tells us to do be it God or the Bible, the New Testament, your, your church, your tradition, your parents, or even culture, but rather from what our authentic self wants to do. Would you agree with this? It's pretty, pretty much the world we live in. Now, I'm not a philosopher by any stretch. I just know enough to, you know, ask the wrong questions and do some damage. But I'm going to take a crack at breaking down how we got here. So prior to, you know, 100-ish years ago, Freud, most Westerners thought about desire through the lens of Augustine. Augustine was a 4th century African playboy who he became a follower of Jesus. He said things like, Lord, give me patience, but not yet. Um, and then he grew, though, into this like towering mind that uh, gave shape to Western thought for like a thousand years. And his basic take on the, the problem of the human condition was it's first and foremost a problem of what he called disordered loves or, or disordered desires. And, and so his basic thesis was this, that, that we're made in the image of God you know, um, in love, by love, 
and that human beings were made to love, that, that we're lovers first and thinkers second. Rational beings, absolutely, yes, but lovers first. And he said the problem isn't that we don't love. It's that we either love the wrong things or we love the right things, but in the wrong order. So example, um, it's, it's not bad to love your career, but when you love your career more than your teenager, that's a disordered love and it's gonna wreak havoc on you and your child. Um, another, it, it's not bad to love your teenager, that's, that's good. But when you love him or her more than God, that's a disordered love and it'll wreak havoc on you and others. So for the post-Augustine West, human flourishing was essentially about saying yes to the right desires and no to all of the other desires. And you would navigate those desires, like which ones do I say yes to, which ones do I say no to, by the cumulative wisdom that's been passed down to you by those who've gone before you. You know, kind of mental maps handed down to you by your family, your, your church, the New Testament, your tradition, etc. And so people would study the great books of the Greek tradition and the Christian tradition in order to become a person of self-mastery. So self-mastery, is a, it's a combination of two things. It's self-discipline and self-control. Uh, self-discipline, it's the ability to do what you do not want to do. You know, like wake up at 5 a.m. and go to the gym. Um, Self-control is the ability to not do what you want to do, like eat that donut when EJ says to me, do you want a donut? Dang it, I failed this morning. Okay, um, together you have self-mastery because the working assumption was that in order to have freedom, you need to have the self mastered to steward that freedom well. So you would study the, the great writers and, and minds because we have all of this wisdom that's been passed down to us through the generations and it provides this mental map to navigate our desires with this end goal of human flourishing. Now in comes a guy named Sigmund Freud. He changes all of that about a century ago, he's working off of Darwin's theory that uh, human beings are not image bearers, but animals. They're, they're not the byproduct of love, but instead are the byproduct of time and chance. He said, the most important desire that you have is your libido, which he would say, it's not just your desire for sex, but it's any pleasure in general. Now don't miss this, okay? For Freud, the repression of desire is the basis for all neurosis. Meaning, when you or, or someone in authority over you says no to an authentic desire, a desire that's true to you, this is what makes you unhappy. Now, just think about how very different that worldview is from that of Augustine. Augustine, you've got human beings are image bearers created in love to love God and each other. But when we disorder our loves and let them run amok, we suffer. Freud, human beings are animals run by instinctual desires for pleasure. And when we repress said desires, we suffer. Now, sadly, Freud's ideas have overtaken Augustine's across the West and what our ancestors used to call chastity now is just a word to kind of poke fun at things. Um, but we now would call that oppression if it's uh, externally imposed or repression if it's internally imposed. What, what they called self-mastery, we now call sin because in our culture, it's a sin not to follow your feelings. 
Cornelius Plantica Jr., he writes this, in an ego-centered culture. So ego in like the Freudian sense, so like in a Freud kind of culture, wants become needs, maybe even duties. Like, you know, you have this responsibility or this, this duty to follow your heart or your desires. He says, the self replaces the soul and human life denigrates into the clamor of competing autobiographies. People get fascinated with how they feel and with how they feel about how they feel. In such a culture and in the throes of such fascination, the self exists to be explored, indulged, and expressed, but not disciplined or restrained. The, the ethicist Robert C. Roberts, he has this observation. He says, we have been led to believe that the self is sacrosanct, meaning it's, it's too important or too valuable to interfere with it. Just as in an earlier time, it was thought never fitting to deny God. Now it feels never right to deny one's self. Even though the first thing that Jesus says to do if we want to follow him is Deny yourself. This is the world that we live in. And out of it comes sayings like, be true to yourself. Anyone remember where that line comes from? I didn't until I was, I was reminded this week. It's from Shakespeare's Hamlet. To thine own self be true. Um, okay, anybody really smart remember who said that line? Anybody? First service people might be smarter than you guys. It was Polonius, who apparently, Polonius, he's the fool in the story. It's the line from the fool, not the wise man, that's become the mantra for today's culture. It's from the fool, yet it's become the rally cry of a generation. Be true to yourself. That the heart wants what it wants. Follow your heart. Or my own personal favorite, you do you, boo. <laughs> we hear this stuff every single day because we've moved from an authority culture to an authenticity culture. And yet Jesus comes with authority. We don't want to be subject to authority. And it's often why people say things or, or think things or you see them behave in such a way that basically says, like, I'm not ready to follow Jesus. Or, or things like, maybe when I'm married or, or when I have kids, I don't want to stop living or I don't, I don't really want to stop having fun yet. Essentially, all of those things equate to, I don't want to practice self-mastery. But Jesus comes with authority. And so what's fascinating to me is, is Luke, he's, he's writing to the Greeks, and this is a selling point of who Jesus is. He comes with authority. And yet us today, we read this and we're like, oh, authority. I don't want anything to do with that. It, it repels us. It's a little upside down, wouldn't you say? But for Luke, it was very important that we understand Jesus comes with authority. He, he has authority in his teaching. He, he has authority over demons. He, he's commanding a demon to be quiet and, and to come out of a man. And we read in verse 36, it says, All the people were amazed and said to each other, What words these are. With authority and power, he gives order to impure spirits and they come out. He, he has authority over illness. Simon Peter, his mother-in-law, is sick in bed. She's bedridden, and he heals her, not just to like, well, a couple days, and you know, I'll be back out of bed, and I'll be back at it. No, she pops right out of bed. She's like, can I make you guys dinner? Five-course meal? What sounds good, guys? What, what can we do? How can I serve you? See, we like Jesus' authority when it comes to his healing and his miracles. We don't like it when it comes to our lives. The, the second thing I think that Luke wants us to see about Jesus here 
is his identity, that, that Jesus is the son of God. And in verse 33, we read this. He cried out at the top of, of his voice. This is a demon crying out. The demon says, go away. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. This demon confessing who Jesus is, you're the Holy One of God. We see it again in, in verse 41. Jesus, he's healing all sorts of people. And it says, moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, you are the son of God. Demons pointing to the identity of Jesus. They knew who he was. And in this case, they're calling him the son of God. This is, this is clearly a point of importance for Luke. The other gospel writers, they don't, they don't really touch on this. But Luke, he wants us to know who Jesus is. Jesus is the Holy One. Jesus is the Son of God. And I've got a lot of juice on this topic of who is Jesus. A lot of juice. I don't have a lot of time. So... Um, Rather than doing the 422-minute version of this message, we're not going to spend a lot of time on, on who Jesus is. Um, you're in a Christian church. You probably know we believe Jesus is the Son of God, and we'll talk about that a lot. But, but what I do want to talk about is how Jesus, this Son of God, this Holy One of God, the, He comes with authority. How did He use His authority and his position, because I think it's important for us to realize, and it's in this narrative, that Jesus's identity shaped his use of authority. Jesus, he, he tells us why he came. Just a few um, verses earlier, if you were to scroll up in, in Luke chapter 4, you'd see verse 18. He quotes the prophet Isaiah, and he says, the spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he, he says all of that, and he says, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And they like lost their minds. I would have loved to be there. This was his manifesto, though. This, this was his mission, his purpose. It's what Jesus intended to do with this authority and power that he's been given. And we see him living it out in this passage. And so what I want to spend the rest of our time today talking about is asking this question. What do we do with Jesus? What do we do with him? He's the son of God. He's, he's the holy one. He's, he comes in power. He uses this power in ways that are so unusual to, you know, compare to others in power. He leverages his power to um, release those less fortunate from their bondage, from their blindness. Like, what do we do with Jesus? And I think the obvious answer is that we should trust him. But this goes against every instinct that we have. Is it fair to say that it is very hard for us to genuinely surrender and entrust ourselves to others? Is that fair? We have basically had a nuclear meltdown of trust in our society. I've stumbled on this thing. Uh, it's called the Edelman Trust Barometer. The Edelman Trust Barometer is, is surveyed tens of thousands of people across dozens of countries, and it's basically surveying them about their level of trust in business, government, media, and NGOs. So they've been doing this for, for 20 plus years. 2019 was the first time that the study found a decline in trust over all four of these institutions. By the way, it's not been improving um, in the last four years. In almost two-thirds of 28 countries surveyed, the general population did not trust the four institutions to, quote, 
do what is right. The average level of trust in all four institutions combined was well below 50%. I think this is interesting. You, if you are a millennial, you are the least trusting generation in American history. Can't blame you. Only 19% of millennials trust other millennials. The, the, the Atlantic did an article where they commented on this idea of a distrust trap. Okay, it's a distrust trap. It's basically this reinforcing cycle of distrust. You withdraw emotional resources. You withdraw intellectual resources and, and financial resources. You only give to those you can believe in and consciously try to exclude those you cannot trust. As a result, our society is getting more and more polarized, more and more broken, more and more suspicious, more and more selfish. Who do we trust? We can't trust the media. We can't trust politicians. We can't trust our neighbors. Like how many of you are like, man, I just trust my neighbors so much. I don't even lock my door. I just leave it open. I let them know like, hey, you need something? Come on in whenever you want. Can we trust religious leaders? Can we trust our parents? Teenagers say yes. Can we trust our spouses? I think more than one person in this room can say their experience would say not to. The divorce rate is ridiculous. We, we live in a society where people just feel like, I can't trust anybody. And as a result, our response, the only person I can trust is me. We basically say, it's up to me. I can't hand my life, my heart, my emotions, my future. I can't hand it over to other people. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to trust myself. And in doing so, we, we try to wrestle control away from God. A futile effort, by the way. And we have a term for this in our society, right? If, if you want control this badly, we call you a control, yeah, control freak. It's such a common term. You are a control freak because you want everything to go your way. And the irony in this whole idea is that the control freak is actually the one being controlled, controlled by fear. Howard Thurman, in his book, Jesus and the Disinheritance, says this, there's nothing new or recent about fear. It's doubtless as old as the life of man on the planet. Fears of many kinds, fears of objects, fear of people, fear of the future, fear of nature, fear of the unknown, fear of old age, fear of disease, fear of life itself. Then there is the fear of which has to do with aspects of experience and detailed states of mind. Our homes, institutions, prisons, churches are crowded with people who are hounded by day and harrowed by night because of some fear that lurks, ready to spring into action as soon as one is alone or as soon as the lights go out or as soon as one's social defenses are temporarily removed. So what I wanna do is give you guys a few uh, diagnostic questions to see if you're taking control or releasing it in trust to Jesus. So the first area, if you're a control freak, this is what you're gonna wanna do. You're gonna wanna control the timing of your life. Control the timing. Uh, you're not gonna trust God to work out the details of your life. You're gonna take this um, the timing of your own agenda, and you're going to take it into your own hands. And, and this can be very challenging for us. So a, a few years back, we had a college group that met in our home on Sunday nights, and it was a really great group. 
Uh, we loved we loved them, loved having them there. And Lauren would make them dinner, so it was good because I didn't make it. Um, we'd have a little Bible study, and then they would stay way later than she can handle. She's not a night owl. And 10 o'clock, Lauren would come out, and she's the best. Anyways, loopy, tired. Anyways, um, I remember I was talking to one of the guys who are part of the group. He's 23, 24 at the time. And I asked about his greatest fear. Do you know what his greatest fear was? Turning 30. <laughs> turning 30. The greatest fear for this guy, he's in his early 20s, his greatest fear is turning 30. I, I'm confused by this because I'm like in my 30s at the time. I'm like, that's rude. Um, but so I said, why? Because his life expectations he, he was so afraid that he wouldn't accomplish the dreams and goals that he had for himself by the time he was 30. He had career aspirations and didn't feel confident that he would meet them. He, he had relationship aspirations that were vitally important to him. And he'd better be a homeowner by the time he's 30. Like, good luck nowadays, right? We want our lives to go a certain way. And if it doesn't follow the arc that we have in mind, it creates incredible temptation to compromise. I need to be in a relationship, but, but that right person hasn't shown up yet. So I'm going to compromise my faith in the, the person that I'm going to date. I'm going to compromise that because it's better than being alone. I want something that I don't quite have the financial resources for, so I'm going to compromise my ethics, my biblical principles, because I want it now. Because I live in a culture of the immediate. But taking destiny into our own hands, it doesn't seize our destiny. It sabotages it. Look at what happened to Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 13. He's, he's Israel's first king. He's tall. He's handsome. He's a leader. Everyone's looking to him. And he has this moment when they're facing the Philistines. They're always facing the Philistines, it seems like. Um, they're in this constant state of conflict with them. But the Philistines, they have this army, it says, as vast as the sand on the sea. His men are pinned down. They're, they're trying to create a rally. And, and Saul calls for Samuel, the prophet, to, to come and to bless them. Like they don't want to go into battle on their own. They need God's protection. This sounds good, right? This is a good thing. But Samuel is late. He says he's going to be there in seven days, but he's not there yet. We all know someone like that. Well, Saul's men, they begin to lose heart. They, they begin to, to scatter. And he says, I, I can't lose my men. Like, I, gotta, I gotta do something. What, what am I gonna do? And so he comes to the conclusion. He says, I will bring the sacrifices and I'll offer them myself. He oversteps his bounds. He plays the role of priest and prophet. He offers the sacrifices. And I mean, it's comical. Like as soon as he does it, what happens? Like Samuel shows up. He's like, I'm here. Finds out what happens. And he's like, do you know what you've done? And Saul's just like, well, I, I, I was expecting you. You took too long. You weren't here. We needed to, we needed to have the sacrifice in order to, to, to please God and have him behind us. And so I went ahead and did it. I, I don't know. You know, he's, he's freaking out. And Samuel says, you have done a foolish thing. The kingdom will be taken away from you and it's gonna be handed to someone who has a heart after God. And so as a result of taking control of timing, he sabotages his future. I mean, so often this happens, controlling timing, the need to get things done when we want them is one sign that you're taking control. The, the second thing is controlling outcomes, which means we will do whatever it takes to get things to turn out the way we want. In fact, we kind of look at that as a good thing, like someone who's gonna do whatever it takes, that's my kind of person. 
And it's hard. There's, there's so many obstacles in, in getting your life to turn out how you want it, right? There's, there's so many forces at work. There's, there's so many other people competing for the same limited resources. And so what happens is you try to control your outcomes, and it, you often find yourself overstepping bounds. And for Jesus followers, there's a lot of temptation to, to compromise to achieve our desired results. And it almost always results in scandals. Um, let's see, do you remember this young lady? I remember a time where she was known for full house. You know, everywhere, you know. yeah, great. Full house, wonderful. What is she known for now? Yeah, college admissions scandal. It's people whose children weren't hardworking enough or intelligent enough or athletically gifted enough to get into these really incredible schools, but their parents had money. And they bought them positions at universities that they didn't deserve or athletic scholarships that they didn't qualify for. Like think about what is in a parent's heart where the parent says, you, you're going to Yale. Like, mm, I don't have the grades to go to Yale. They're like, no, 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 no. That doesn't matter. You're going to Yale. All because they want to be able to be at a party or be in a social setting with a coworker or whatever it is. You're in the break room and they want to be able to say, you know, Tommy went to Yale. You need to cook it. You, you manufacture life. You, you control your life. Controlling outcomes is a form of taking control from God. It's an addiction to, to making sure that we get what we want. Uh, another one is controlling people, con controlling others. And, and this one's really interesting because it's been my general, like personal experience um, that people don't necessarily love being manipulated or controlled. I don't know. But uh, ironically, it's happening to you all of the time if you have a phone in your pocket. What we don't love consciously um, love the practice of being manipulated or controlled. It, it's terrifying to give your heart to someone and they just run off. They leave. So we do everything in our power to manipulate and control the situation. And sometimes it's like super subtle. You know, you, you know that the person you're with has low self-esteem and so you just have like a, you know, kind of a well-placed, timely comment about their looks. So they never gain the confidence to leave you. Or, or um, maybe you're a manager and, and you see someone who's like moving up the ranks and you're like, I do not want this person to blow past me. So you take your position, maybe you just a subtle change to a report here or a subtle comment to a superior or HR or whatever that looks like. Nothing crazy, but just to slow them down a little. This happens in so many ways, our need to control others. And so the question for today, like if you were to walk away thinking about only one thing, I hope it's this, it's this question. Do I trust Jesus with my life? Or am I trying to wrestle control away from him? Jesus, the son of God, the holy one. He comes in power. He comes with authority. And admittedly, this is scary. But he wields his power to love and care for us. He, he takes this leadership and, and authority that he has and he flips it upside down. He, he, he doesn't leverage it for his own benefit. But instead, we, we read in Philippians that despite being God, he made himself a servant, that he humbled himself, that he gave his life for us. This is not the type of authority that we are used to. 
This is not the type of authority that we've experienced in our own lives, in our relationships. Like finally, there is someone we can trust. But our experience in life has been one of trust leading to pain. And so as a result, we try to wrestle control away from any outside force, including God, and take control for ourselves. How's that working? You know, I've, I've been under some additional stress lately. Not, not, not to get into the details or, you know, not looking for, for pity. I, I think this is something that's very common. We all have these moments and seasons in life. And um, so I'm just dealing with some, some different stressors. A lot's been going on. I know you can relate to this. And so I'm just, I'm sitting in the hot tub at night by myself and I'm just reflecting. And I find myself asking, this is a question I try to ask myself in seasons like this, like what is God looking for from me in this season? You, what is he teaching me? Um, what does he want for me? Because I, I sincerely believe that God is incredibly for me, for you, for us. What does he want for me? And in this case, the answer was just really clear. It's trust. He's looking for me to trust him. When not everything is going your way, do you trust him? When, when the timing of something is just really sucky. Do you trust him? And I sat in this hot tub and I, I felt like the father who, who brings his son to Jesus and the, the son needs healing. And Jesus says to the father, like, do you believe I can do this? And the father says, I believe. Help my unbelief. Like, I, I believe you can do this, but, but, but I, I probably don't have all the belief I need. Will you help me? I trust you, God. But in those moments where I need more trust than I have, will you help me? When, when the timing isn't going my way, God, help me trust you. When life gives me lemons, I don't want lemonade. I, I want to trust you. When I don't have all the trust I need, help me trust you. This life is incredibly fragile, and I know, I know that you have been burned by misplaced trust. But if we put our trust in Jesus, he will never let us down. He has the power. He has the authority. He has the ability. And maybe most importantly, the desire to care for us. And so we turn to him. We go to him with our needs. He says, cast your cares on me because I care for you. And so let's, just, let's pray together. Jesus, there are so many forces at work trying to keep us from trusting you, trying to keep us from laying our, our anxiety, our, our baggage, our misplaced trust at your feet. There are so many forces at work. And so God, I just pray that we would be able to look to you in the power of your spirit and just say, I believe, help my unbelief. I trust you, Lord, but give me more trust. Help me to grow in trust. And so I pray, Lord, that your spirit would, would fill us with trust this week for the, the many things that we are all facing where our trust is being challenged. Would you fill us with more trust? Would you help us give our whole hearts and our whole selves to you? 
We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.